And my name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana, a voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, uh, the Communications Committee. I'm also uh, co-chair of ICAD USA and a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. Co-hosts for today's interview are Mark Braverman of Kairos USA and Bart Dan Bohr of Kairos West Michigan. Co-sponsors are the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace and ICAD USA. It's our honor to speak, as you know, to Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac, pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, co-chair of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, and academic dean at Bethlehem Bible College. Munther, welcome. Let's, let's get right to it. People want to hear from you. We've seen mixed reviews of the UN's uh, International Court of Justice ruling. It said that there was plausible evidence of Israel committing genocide in Gaza and ordered Israel to show proof within a month that it was reversing course on its indiscriminate targeting of civilians in Gaza and obstruction of humanitarian aid. But it stopped short of calling for a ceasefire. Give us your take on the ICJ ruling, please. Yes, yeah, so... Um... Thank you for the introduction, and I hope that uh, while driving, the connection is uh, um, stable enough. For me, the ruling is, and, and uh, I've heard someone describe it, and I, I think it's a, a good description, uh, better than expected, yet fall short of what is needed. So again, better than expected, yet fall short uh, from what is needed. Uh, I, I would say better than expected because it repeated and echoed and confirmed all the accusations and read them even again from the mouth of uh, the Israelis themselves. Um, I think it said implicitly that Israel is committing genocide. And also, I would say uh, the uh, voting being uh, 15 to 2 or 16 to 1 was very surprising to me. Uh, this is why I said it was better than uh, expected. Uh, the only thing, which is why we said not what is needed, is that it's not called for a ceasefire. Uh, and that was disappointing, especially given previous years and other cases. I think in, in Russia they called for a ceasefire, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but I would then say uh, the following. I think this is the first time in history that Israel is ever held accountable. So uh, regardless of the ruling itself, uh, I think uh, this was a monumental moment um, in that uh, uh, Israel's crimes were uh, clear to the world to see that's number one. And second, uh, Israel was forced to defend itself. Uh, the ruling, as I said, implicitly said uh, Israel is committing genocide and gave Israel a month to get back to the court and actually show that it is doing its best that to, to make sure it's not committing genocide. So uh, all of this is, is good because, as I said, uh, I've been always saying it. Israel is doing what it's doing because no one ever held Israel accountable. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is that I think this, uh, the ICJ deliberations themselves, to me, uh, uh, regardless of their, you know, apart from the results, not regardless, apart from the results, were powerful because uh, it was South Africa who led the deliberations. Exactly. Uh, given that it's a country that endured colonialism, it's the people who endured colonialism, the land that endured colonialism and apartheid that led this, I think, uh, indicates for sure what we have been saying and seeing for a while, namely that the moral credibility, the moral authority in the world today does not lie, does not lie uh, in the so-called free world, the Western world, the democracy and human rights, but to the contrary, uh, they 
prove themselves to be hypocritical uh, and dealing with double standards. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard many of my statements of how angry we are on the hypocrisy of the Western world. Uh, and I think uh, South Africa presented itself as the moral authority in the world, the one that holds credibility. I hope this uh, begins the actual shift where the global South and those coming from a context of colonization uh, lead the uh, free world. And I mean it now, the free world, and not the so-called free world, if you know what I mean. So this is what I think of the ICT. Thank you, Munther. Um, two other things happened last week in addition to the ICJ ruling. And just give me a second to tell, to explain both of them uh, that we, we know. First of all, the day after the ruling, I mean, who does this? Uh, the State Department, the U.S. State Department withheld funds from UNRWA because of Israel's allegations that UNRWA members participate in October 7th. Second, on Friday last week, our friends at Defense for Children International Palestine sued the U.S. government, accusing President Biden and other officials of complicity in Israeli violations against Palestinians under international human rights law. Now, you were just in the U.S. late last year and met with some officials in, officials in D.C., and if I remember correctly, you were frustrated and disappointed and maybe some other adjectives. So, Talk to us about the complicity and criminality of the U.S. government in Israel's genocide. Yeah, and and and, and let me talk first about the uh, UNRWA ruling because I think it's important. Uh, and, and again, uh, and I said this uh, on the sermon on Sunday. Yeah, the the. Uh, it, it, the amount of hypocrisy manifested in that decision by the UK and the US and whoever also decided to freeze the support Munther, you uh we lost you. Munther, we lost you. Allegations by Israel are enough for Israel, for these countries to stop the funding of one of the most important uh, agencies right now that's doing humanitarian work. And they're only allegations. And if you read the allegations, many of them came based on torture. And not only that, uh, uh, they're talking about 12 employees and um, Michael, let me assume that actually 12 UNRWA employees, out of thousands of UNRWA employees actually, uh, were engaged in uh, mass attacks. Does that merit such a decision from the United States, especially given the fact that uh, in front of the whole world, it was proven that Israel committed war crimes. And let's remember what happened today. I don't think you... Uh, today we have actual footage from the Israeli military in the West Bank, uh, in Jenin, yeah. uh, in, in entering a hospital, assassinating patients in the hospital, three young men, while dressed like nurses and patients, an actual obvious war crime. I it, Tell me if I missed the news. Did the U.S. fund its support to Israel? You didn't miss the news. Okay. So the, the utter hypocrisy uh, in the Western world is appalling. And I think uh, we need to call things for they are. To me, this says nothing. This doesn't. This this is clear and manifest hypocrisy, and not just hypocrisy. Behind it is a, a clear and manifested racism. Uh, the double standard behind it is what I said. This appalling uh, racism. Um, 
and I was talking to a friend today. I think I lost hope in the uh, so-called Western system. Uh, I'm telling, and I told European friends, I never want you to talk to us about human rights again. Uh, and every time I go to the Congress, I leave depressed. Uh, I leave depressed because of several issues. Uh, uh, one of them being the fact that, um, uh, you know, those involved in the decisions actually uh, know little, but act with a sense of prejudice. Uh, and it's hard to argue uh, when this is the kind of mentality you have. Uh, so, yeah, this is, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Thank you. You know, we're uh, we're at day 116 now uh, of Israel's uh, genocidal assault on Gaza. We, we know the statistics, right? 35,000 Gazans killed, more than 400 in the West Bank. 70,000 wounded, 40% children, 85% of people um, uh, removed from their homes, uh, this crisis in Rafa. But I, I'd like for you to talk about, uh, as someone who ministers to congregants and others, one of the more underreported questions, and that is the invisible uh, uh, trauma, the, bodil the bodily, the psychological trauma, the hidden injuries, and even uh, more, the, the long-term psychological impact of the trauma. And we'll try to get you, since you are going to get on. There you are on your computer. Good. Yes, shifted from font to computer. I hope that's helpful. Uh, Did you hear the question, Munther? Yeah, the yes. psychological, the long-term. So there is first the, the long-term trauma on those in Gaza. Uh, whether it's actually dealing with actual physical injuries. We know that many will have lost body parts. And actually, as a matter of uh, procedure, if you had an injury and you got to the hospital, most likely they did amputation to you and, and very likely also without anesthesia because there is no medical system right now in Gaza. So many people lost body parts, sadly. Uh, and then the, the, the trauma, the psychological trauma itself from what our friends are telling us is, is horrifying. Our, the children, the women who don't sleep, the men who are concerned, uh, the level of uh, humiliation people are facing just to get wheat to make bread. Uh, it's, it's appalling, with, especially when it comes to a country that is uh, to a people that um, have a very sense, high sense of pride, you know, and to go through the shame of standing in line or fighting just to get wheat, the images are heartbreaking. Uh, I don't know if if this happened to me, if I will ever recover. Um, and you're talking about millions uh, of, of Gazans who are now starving and just looking for any uh, piece of food. Um, the Difficult feeling right now for us here in the West Bank, uh, knowing that we feel powerless and knowing that we feel abandoned, actually, not just powerless. We feel we don't can't do anything, but there is also a sense of, sense of abandonment, to be honest, um, not just by our, you know, uh, the other side, but also by our friends, because this war revealed to us where many whom we thought are our friends are actually standing right now. Uh, sadly, uh, you know, uh, we thought that there was those on our side, churches that always talked about peace and justice that still didn't call for a ceasefire. Uh, so it's, it's really sad. Uh, and, uh, it's going to take a lot to recover. And the fate of the 2 million refugees right now is unknown. I can't even imagine being in their shoes, trying to survive, but then not knowing where I will end up with, whether 
in Egypt or outside or in the West Bank. Uh, we know that homes are destroyed. Uh, the people I talked to lost their homes. Uh, and now they have to begin life somewhere else from zero, if not from minus, and dealing with the psychological fear and trauma. Uh, it's going to take years. But we are resilient. Um, in our recent history, in the last 75 years, this is... Uh, this is this is worse than the Nakba, let's be clear. But um, we survive, and I think the resilience of the Palestinian, we, as I said, I think we will be okay. We will be okay because uh, we are on the right side of history. And what I can't understand is how will I live with myself if I was complicit with such a genocide? How do people live with themselves? when they see these images from Gaza, the, the images we continue to see even today, especially with the rain now. And I'm not a politician, Michael, even though now I get interviewed by the media thinking I have the solution for the... Uh, but I look at it from a moral, ethical issue. How can you live with yourself knowing that you were complicit in such a horrifying genocide? This is this is what I can't get. I I've been talking here, um, uh, in in writing and in presentations and sermons, that Israel's assault uh, is is not a war only against Hamas and not a war against Gaza, not even a war against the Palestinian people, but a war on Palestinian history, on Palestinian memory, Palestinian tradition. Palestinian culture. It's a war against the very idea of Palestine itself. It's a it's a war to erase Palestine from human memory. I mean, that's the very definition of genocide. Yes. Uh, it, talk to us about your perspective, Michael. Uh, you don't need to ask my perspective. You need to listen to what Israeli officials are saying. Yeah. Why would they destroy universities, residential buildings, cultural centers, including the Orthodox Church's recently built cultural center? Uh, and they're boasting about it. They're boasting about killing the possibility of life in Gaza. And uh, they don't feel the obligation to lie about their intentions. Yesterday, there was a big conference in Israel for many settler groups uh, and Israeli government ministers were there. And they were openly calling for resettling uh, and building settlements in Gaza. That's right. Now, um, your own, I think, Rashida Tlaib was, uh, you know, because she said from the river to the sea, it was a big deal. And she's not even, you know, she, she's an American congressman. Now you have Israeli officials telling you that they will erase Gaza and build settlements on it. And the world is fine. And all we hear, no, no, we will not let them do it. Listen, we've heard the story before. Uh, when was America ever able to say no to Israel, especially in the recent history? And every time I speak with, uh, you know, either diplomats, Europeans or Americans, and they say, no, no, uh, there are red lines. I say, come on, we've heard this before. These are all empty words to us. You say one thing and facts on the ground speak another thing. I think this will be a test to the will of the world right now. Uh, whether they are serious about uh, rebuilding Gaza for the Palestinians and whatever they're talking about and that the refugees should return. I don't know to return to what, but whatever. Or Ben Gvir will build settlements and they will erase. Um, in Palestine, we always knew the intentions of this world, of this war. That's right. Um, and as I would tell uh, people, um, I would maybe, maybe, I would uh, excuse you if you didn't see it in the first week. To I'm talking about people in the West. Three weeks, month, month and a half. 
And guys, it's been 116 days. I don't know how many days now. Come on. Are you listening to what they're telling you they're doing? Are you seeing the footages? Are you reading the numbers? They're destroying Gaza. This is an annihilation. And the intentions to resettle Gaza are not uh, to build settlements in Gaza, but not just on the outskirts of Gaza, deep in Gaza. They're not hiding their intentions. They are not hiding their intentions. Other officials are not hiding their intentions about the so-called voluntary immigration. They're talking, they're telling you, they're telling you they're doing it. What, what is the world doing? They're suspending funds to UNRWA because of 12 people allegedly involved in the October 7th attack. This is the level of hypocrisy and racism we're dealing with. This is genocide in real time right before our eyes. And we're, uh, we have Christian nationalism on the right and Christian impotence on the left. And, um, and most of the world is silent at best and complicit and criminal at worst. Um, Munther, let me, uh, our eyes are rightly focused on Gaza, but there's, uh, um, that's provided a lot of cover for Israel to do a lot of damage, uh, build extra settlements, destroy more homes, evict more people in the West Bank. So I, I, <clears throat> I want you to just tell us, first of all, how you and your family are doing because many mem many members on the phone call here have been to Palestine. So how are you and your family doing? How is Bethlehem doing? And talk to us about the West Bank in general. Uh, I'm okay. It doesn't matter how I'm doing. <laughs> There's a genocide in Gaza. That, that's, that's the story. I'm okay. Uh, whatever is happening to us is, is fine. And we're not talking about the West Bank because it feels silly to talk about it in comparison to what's happening in Gaza. Believe me, if this was before October 7th and what's happening in the West Bank uh, was happening then, we would have, you know, uh, raised our voices. But we're not talking about it because of the severity of the genocide in Gaza. Uh, the West Bank right now is... Um, uh, is the target of numerous incursions that happen right now on a daily basis. Uh, even in Bethlehem, that you know, it feels like it's happening on a daily basis. Uh, it's very common to see Israeli military cars in the middle of Bethlehem now, especially in the early hours of the day. Uh, they uh, go into homes, they search homes, uh, usually, you know, they came to Beit Sahur, they found nothing, but they search homes. Uh, they've attacked a 11 years old child in our town. Today, as I said, they killed three people in the hospital. Uh, these are these are daily occurrences. Bethlehem is uh, isolated from uh, Jerusalem. Right now, uh, the by the side roads are open. But the main roads are closed for between, um, if you're coming from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, the main checkpoint is closed uh, with exceptions. Most of the permits were canceled. Uh, so very many, many people lost their jobs in Jerusalem. So there is high unemployment in Bethlehem as a result of uh, uh, the closure of Jerusalem and the fact that there is no uh, tourism. Um is it safe? You know, um, uh, I, life goes on. We go to our jobs normally. Uh, you have to be careful where to go and where not to go. But as I said, I mean, just four days ago, the Israeli cars were right at Manger Square. I mean, in the heart of Manger Square, Israeli military cars. Um. We're surviving, but we're seeing many people leave. Uh, they get tired of life here. They get tired of this lifestyle, especially now that even a trip to Ramallah might take three to four hours. Um, so uh, um, psychologically, people feel down. Uh, when I say we are broken, I mean it. Uh, because of all the images we see, all the trauma of what's, you know, it's, and as I said, it's nothing compared to what's happening in Gaza. But you can still come to Bethlehem. 
I, I saw a question on the chat. Um, it's not as easy as it used to be. In other words, just drive normally through the checkpoint, but there are other roads. And once in Bethlehem, you're safe. Sadly, we don't see many people, but we're uh, we're making calls now for people to come and 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 visit us and be with us in Bethlehem. Uh, so uh, uh, we've just announced that Christ at the checkpoint in May will take place. Uh, some people ask, is it safe? And I say, uh, we're asking you to come and be in solidarity with us, uh, even if there is a minimal risk involved. You know that uh, you and Mark Braverman and Doug Thorpe and I will be meeting after this call for a few minutes to talk about a delegation at the end of February sponsored by Kairos USA to stand with Kairos Palestine and the Global Kairos uh, or, or, uh, for Justice Coalition. And for all of you who are on this call, you can look to hear more from myself and Doug Thorpe and Mark Braverman at Kairos USA about that in the next number of days after we talk to Munther. Uh, yeah, Munther and, and Michael, one of the most uh, uh, profound acts of solidarity that I've ever, uh, and it's hard to put in words what it meant to us, was when South African leaders uh, made the call and said, well, actually we told them we need you to come and they immediately said, yes, we're coming. And uh, to our surprise, they said, yes, we're coming in two weeks. So we had to organize everything in two weeks, uh, even less. And they left their churches, their families during Christmas. You're talking about uh, influential leaders and some of them pastor churches, uh, big churches, uh, including the dean of the cathedral in Johannesburg. Right. Uh, and they said, Christmas is canceled in Bethlehem, the celebrations, we're coming to be with you. And we're going to come through Jordan uh, uh, because, you know, we don't want to come through Tel Aviv. Uh, so they've added another dimension to their trip, another day, another layer. And they just came and spent time with us. Uh, they visited churches. They prayed with us. They were in attendance when I gave the sermon on the 23rd. They were on the 24th. And as I said, it's hard to put in words uh, what that meant to us. Uh, I, was, I was on the phone with, I was on a Zoom call with uh, Father Edwin Arison from Cairo, yes. South Africa yesterday. And we talked with the group that I was on the call with. Uh, I asked him to share with us about his visit uh, and the South Africa visit. Let me let me ask you. And, and there were there were a few Americans as well, by the way. It wasn't yeah. just South Africans. Yeah. Well, you you you've answered this question uh, a number of times over the last few weeks. Uh, you and Christmas Lutheran Church went viral this past Christmas uh, when Bethlehem canceled public celebrations, encouraging Christians to celebrate in their homes and churches. You all at Christmas Lutheran Church created this powerful inspiring and prophetic Christ under the rubble. And many of us who preach at churches and teach uh, use the image and quoted you, Munther, as you know, uh, and we just shared the two and a half minute YouTube that you created. So I want you to just talk to us about Christ under the rubble. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's good to see how it came to life, uh, the idea. And uh, the, the idea came uh, from, uh, it, it began with the sermon that I gave, I think the third Sunday after war. Uh, and back then we were really uh, 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 troubled by the images. Back then there were many images coming. Um, electricity was not cut and, and connections. Uh, and just after the church was hit and nine children were killed. Uh, and we were very angry from everything, from everyone, uh, even from God. And I said, you know, where God, where is, why did you leave Gaza? And I preached a sermon of lament. And I said, where is God? And in that sermon, uh, I said, we search for God. Uh, and we asked the question, where is God in the midst of this? 
and we did not find a philosophical answer nor a theological answer, but rather our experience, and I've learned this from my predecessor, Mitri Rahib, a Palestinian theologian and pastor, everyone knows, when he said, God uh, shares the fate of his people in this land. The God of this land shares the fate of its people. His house is destroyed, his son is killed, the land is made to waste. Um, and so I brought his words to the current conflict and I said, God is under the rubble in Gaza. God is in the operating room. We see God in every child killed. Uh, and that was a message first and foremost addressed to our people. Uh, I was trying to help uh, the Christian community in Bethlehem in the midst of a very deep crisis, knowing that many people listen to my words, not just in our congregation. And I said, God is under the rubble. Uh, we see him in every child pulled from under the rubble. Uh, and that message resonated, as I said, and the idea of a God who suffers with us, who's, who's in solidarity with those who are oppressed, to the extent that he died on the cross as a victim of the very same violence. And so when we were about to prepare for Christmas, and I know we're not going to have a tree, the connection between the Christmas story, what's happening in Gaza, and the concept of God under the rubble was very natural to me. Um, not only uh, because of Jesus under the rubble, but the Christmas story, including the element of children killed and the Holy Family becoming refugees. Uh, Jesus, when he was born, he was in solidarity with the oppressed, uh, uh, with the occupied. He was born among the marginalized to the extent that he himself survived a massacre only to become a refugee with his family into Egypt. So he experienced displacement, his family experienced displacement. So the connection was natural. And I, we, uh, as, a, as a church, uh, you know, church family came, including children. We all gathered, many of us. And uh, we created this uh, manger. Uh, I never expected it would go this viral. Uh, I put it in the church. I preach in Arabic. I explained the meaning to our congregants. People were literally in tears. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we looked at it the first time we when we finished putting it and we looked at it i wasn't this you know it was just it spoke to us in a very powerful way uh and then i shared it on the social media and uh in addition to that i because of the attention it received i i added the element to explaining its meaning by saying this is what christmas looks like in bethlehem in palestine today this is what and and uh, uh, our children, the world is celebrating while our children are under the rubble, our families are displaced and our homes are destroyed. Uh, and if Jesus were to be born today, he would be born under the rubble in Gaza. So this was uh, the, the, the message behind it. So I emphasize this was a message to our people first, but then it was a message to the world. And I'm grateful for the many, many churches who in solidarity read that message, tried to do something similar. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful that God used us to send a powerful message to the world, not just about Gaza, and that's the most important thing, but also about the meaning of the Christmas, the meaning of the incarnation of Emmanuel, and really challenge the way many Christians are complicit uh, in, in, this, in this world. When you and I've talked in the past, uh, when you met with our group uh, this past uh, June, you, you've mentioned that when you do your tours and you know, speaking, you like to focus on engaging with people who identify as Christian Zionists, uh, not just speak to the choir, but by people who are, who, like I say, are Christian Zionists. Kairos Palestine and all of us on the call today realize it's a Christian heresy, but Christian Zionists in our country and others, hold important positions of political power here in the UK and other countries. So, you know, I mentioned that uh, impunity and untruth and propaganda are part of empire, but also religious legitimation 
of oppression is part of uh, Empire Two. So talk to us about the theological and politically destructive nature of Christian Zionism. Um, here is, you know, um, I'm thinking of a quote that Mike Johnson, who's now all of a sudden became the House Speaker, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Uh, what he said, um, I think right after or right before he was elected. And he said, as Christians, the Bible tells us to support Israel. We are, uh, our, it's our duty as Christians to support Israel. And if you think of what he's saying, uh, what he's basically saying is that Christians should support Israel regardless of the context, regardless or whether Israel is committing war crimes or not. Uh, it doesn't matter what Israel does. The Bible says support Israel, you support Israel. So even if Israel commits a suicide, it's, this is the kind of uh, simplistic yet very dangerous theology that Christian Zionism represents today uh, a theology that actually has nothing to do with simply a theological belief about the end times or about uh, eschatology, because it's it's more of a worldview and a political worldview, and uh, that's usually translated into political uh, activism. Uh, and into support of colonization and empire. Uh, you've got now Israel, which is uh, a state founded by European settlers as a settler colonial endeavor, facilitated by the um, facilitated by the um, facilitated by the British Empire then and theology, biblical interpretation was just the justification and the rationale for this colonial project. If you actually think of it from distance and if you step outside of what's happening uh, sorry, you step off outside the Christian circles and look from distance what you basically have is a group of people imposing their religious beliefs on another group of people by asking them, actually not asking, by forcing them to accept the notion that their God gave them this land thousands of years ago and as such they're entitled to it. And so when they kick you out of it, when they commit ethnic cleansing, it's because God gave it to us. Uh, imagine such a narrative in any other context. Uh, imagine it uh, outside of our, you know, and I think Christians sometimes are so caught into this, they don't see the picture in, in its in its fullest impression. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's It's colonialism, but somehow we convince the world that, no, it's not. It's the Jews returning to their land. They were here thousands of years ago. Thousands of years. Really? It's not colonialism? Because Jews are returning to their land? So a Jew born in Russia today, if he decides to come and live in a settlement in Bethlehem, he's returning to his land. But a Palestinian kicked from his land in Gaza now probably will never be able to get back. He has no right in the land. Why? Well, religion, theology, the Bible. No. Why? Because of colonialism. Why? Because of prejudice and 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 racism towards Palestinians. The cover okay. is is theology. One one of the most frustrating things for us who stand with Palestine, I mean, no surprise, right, is the absolute bias of the Western corporate-owned media. 
Um, I've got two two parts to this question. So talk to us first about why, in your view, the Western media is so intent on supporting Israel's uh, uh, propaganda. But on the other hand, and this is part two, Israel's targeting Palestinian journalists, uh, 140 or so murdered since October 7th. Uh, there's a war on truth that's happening, an all-out propaganda offensive. So there are two sides of the same coin, really, this war on truth. But it, uh, uh, Western support for the uh, Israel's propaganda narrative and then the, the murdering of Palestinian uh, journalists. Yeah, um, I think it's, and, and it's good that we're seeing some change in American media, some change. I'm not excited. I'm not saying it's, uh, it's balanced now or any of that sort. And at least there are now other sources. Um, there are uh, ways of actually looking for alternative news or not, I mean, for example, Al Jazeera English and other. Uh, but uh, there is definitely bias. And there is definitely uh, favoritism. And it's hard to explain. It's really hard to explain uh, that you're supposed to be, just tell the truth uh, and, and, and um, be objective, yet the way the media is used against the Palestinians, uh, in a similar way Hollywood is used against Arabs in general, Muslims and Palestinians, is is part of the war. It's part of the story. It's it's, and the media, even the so called you know even the the media that's considered a little bit friendly to the Palestinians, they all uh, uh, begin everything with October seventh and uh, promote the idea of self defense. One of the things that it's really interesting, and we mentioned it in the first question or second, I think. So I think the media seldom questions the Israeli narrative. Yeah. Uh, maybe sometimes out of fear of, of, of anti-Semitism. I don't know. But it's really hard to question, and I don't see people questioning the Israeli narrative. Um, <laughs> in a time when I think there was a study... Uh, during the first month on the war that found out that only 4% of Israelis, Michael, let me repeat this, only 4% of Israelis, 4, not 40, 4, think that Netanyahu is a credible source on the war. Can you, can you believe that? So Israelis know that Netanyahu lies. Yet does anyone dare question any statement by this. So now they tell you 12 people were come and, and you know, they don't even, yeah, they, we, we, you know, we tortured them and they told us they're Hamas and they're in honor. Everyone believes them, uh, even the media. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it needs to be challenged. Let me put it this way. And it's time we challenge it. It's time we call things for they are. And it's time to call the media for its double standards. Um, one of the things that I've seen is uh, the level of uh, attention, uh, humanization, for example, of the Israeli hostages. And I feel for the hostages. I feel for their families especially the children. No one should be exposed to this. This is not right. But there are 6,000 Palestinian hostages since October 7th only. I've never seen CNN going to the house of a Palestinian hostage or prisoner who was released and talking to him in the same way they did with the released Israeli hostages. Why? I tell you why. Because they accepted the Israeli narrative that these are terrorists with no proof. Uh, even knowing that the majority of these Palestinians who are who were arrested since October 7th actually didn't go to trial. Israel doesn't actually care to send them to trial. They have the military called and the administrative detention. So it's all part of the narrative. It's all part of the package um, and so on. And yes, I mean, now, sadly, sadly, 
even the Palestinian journalists are targeted. More than 100 were killed in this war. And to me, I've been talking about three people, in, three uh, people groups in Gaza, three professionals uh, that everybody, you know, we're, we're amazed by the level of he heroism and sacrifice people in Gaza are putting. But then I think in particular of what the journalists are doing. They are risking everything to tell the world what's happening. And can you imagine how deflating it is that this war is still happening? They're telling us, they're, they're broadcasting their own genocide. And it's still happening. I feel, I feel, you know, I, and we hear them. I don't know. I don't know how much you get from the Palestinian journalists, especially those on the social media now. And they're like, we're broadcasting everything. Why isn't the world responding? What else do they need to see? Yeah. So deflating. Uh, the other groups, by the way, are the doctors and the first responders who risk everything and work tirelessly. And many others, not just those three, but uh, I, I think and I feel for the journalists, uh, many of whom lost uh, their families. And as you said, more than 100 uh, of them were killed in this war. Munter, I know it's late. I have two more questions for you, uh, if you'll just bear with me. Um, um, a ceasefire has to be the bare minimum, right? But um, I know you're, <laughs> I'm probably asking you an impossible question, but what do you predict will happen next? And what needs to happen? Maybe that's the better question. What needs to happen next in your view? Um Listen, Michael, if, if, if two people are fighting, uh, ask me this question. Uh, but when someone is giving a very heavy beating to another, what needs to happen is for this beating to stop and then we'll talk. I can't think beyond this genocide stopping. You know, we, we, and, and, and to be honest, I really get angry when I hear reports or read reports about the day after war. Yeah. As if we have to agree about what happens the day after war for this genocide to stop. Every day that is, uh, every day that passes, hundreds die. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to talk about the day after. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, all I'm thinking about is the little girl I saw this morning in the middle of the rain selling whatever they had so that they can get food for the family. Uh, the man carrying two children less than two years old, one in this hand, and, and, and calling Biden, Blinken. What did they do? Why did you kill them? Uh, I mean, these images that we were saying are, are breaking our heart. And I don't want to talk about the day after war. I don't want to take about anything other than we need to put all of our efforts to stop the genocide. And then we'll talk and then we'll find a solution. Um, and the other thing that drives me crazy is that uh, the other day they were talking about a meeting to discuss all of these issues uh, and they were mentioning the Americans and the Egyptians and the Qataris and the Israelis and who knows who and the Palestinians are not in the meeting. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that is widely circulated and rumored is that just before October 7th, Israel and Saudi Arabia were talking. I don't know how true it is. And they were close for a deal. And while in the, in the, in the, at the hell in Washington, when this was told to us, I said, were Palestinians involved? And they said, no. I said, don't you learn? Do you think you're going to solve by continuing to ignore, solve anything by continuing to grow, ignore Palestinians? I, I don't get it. So this is my answer. Sorry. Uh, no, no, this no. One needs to stop. I understand. You know, the Abraham Accords, the uh, the U.S. wants to buy off all these neighboring countries, but don't want to involve the Palestinians. And, you know, I read that uh, the day after the ICJ ruling, Israel killed 484 Palestinians. And so you're right. I mean, uh, the focus needs to be on just stopping the killing, stopping the genocide, stopping the war. Let me ask you, and maybe maybe this is an inappropriate question too, but I read it on their Facebook page, and it's a piece of good news, and it goes and it goes to the the question before about combating Christian Zionism. 
Bethlehem Bible College is launching a PhD program in theology grounded in Middle East, uh, the Middle Eastern context in collaboration with Lebanon, uh, the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary there and the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo and a Protestant uh, seminary in Amsterdam. Uh, this is good news. I, I know that our focus has been on Gaza. It needs to be on Gaza. It needs to be on the genocide. But this kind of a program is going to go a long ways to combat the Christian Zionism that is rampant and that is supporting the genocide. Do you want to comment on that? I I, um, I, I have so, you on, and so I, I wanted to ask. Yeah, you know, it's something I've been part of for the last six years, so I better talk about it. Thank you for asking. I didn't expect it. Um, let me tell you how I look at it. Uh, let me explain. Uh, you have three pioneering and very creative seminaries, uh, one in Cairo, one in Bethlehem, one in Beirut. Uh, you know, and our college is called BBC, Bethlehem Bible College. When we were trying to look for a name for this uh, coalition of three colleges, I suggested Beirut, Bethlehem, Cairo, BBC. <laughs> and I fooled them for 10 seconds, and then it's like, no, we know what you're doing. <laughs> but it didn't work, so it's now uh, we have a different name. Uh, amazing, amazing partners. Uh, the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary in Beirut and the uh, Presbyterian Seminary in, in, in Cairo and we at Bethlehem Bible College interdenominational. Um, and I think the power of that coalition is that it's Middle Eastern, it's Arab, and it's us coming together and saying uh, enough of Western uh, biased theological education and enough of going to the West and doing um, the PhD studies on topics that interest the West in Western circles and so on. We want to make theological education authentic. And we want to talk to ourselves. We want to uh, theologize among ourselves first. Uh, and I think uh, we have proven that we have not just the people, but the experience, the writings that challenge uh, Western readings of scripture, not just on Christian Zionism, but including Christian Zionism. Uh, so I'm proud that we are at the level in which we say uh, we want to work on our own with our, you know, we want to do something on our own in our own terms. Uh, and this was actually part of the deal with the Protestant Theological University in uh, uh, in, in in the Netherlands. They 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 gave us the flexibility and the freedom to talk about the topics, the supervisors, the and so on. Um, and to tie it with everything that's happening in Gaza and going back to the ICJ, South Africa, uh, this is the time for the church in the global south to take the lead. And I believe the court could be a beginning, uh, not just on the moral credibility and, as I said, where the moral authority lies, but also now the theological reading as well. Um and it's important for us in the global south to uh, break loose, I would say, from the theological domination of the Western world. Yeah. And, and free ourselves of that attachment. For that to happen, we need these conversations. So the fact that this is a collaboration between Egypt, Lebanon, and Palestine to me is is everything you need to know. This is this is the power of it. And at the same time, Michael, at the Bible College, uh, we hosted uh, two months ago uh, theologians from India. We did a conversation: Dalit theology versus Palestinian theology. Wow. We're sending our students to South Africa. Um, next month to learn uh, of their anti-apartheid theology and movement. This is what needs to happen now. 
churches in the global south from context of colonization needs to come together, read the Bible together, learn from one another, and rely on one another. Uh, especially, uh, I think the lessons from Gaza to us, uh, uh, at least now, uh, are, you know, among the lessons that uh, uh, from the war in Gaza is that, uh, you know, even those we thought were our friends stood us down. And it's time to really, say, you know, realize that we can't depend on the West. Um, and when the genocide was happening, many, many were complicit. So I think it's it's really important. Timing is, 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 you know, maybe it's no coincidence that we launched this program now. As I said, we've been working on it for six years. So, yeah.